Well, hello everyone, this is Alfadi, and I wanna welcome you now to the official start of this um, fascinating series that you are going to find to be very exciting, uh, very revealing, and uh, also very bold, really, uh, to say the least, in terms of some of the topics that we are going to address, of course. The series that I'm referring to is going to be with Brother Mill, and we called it Holes in the Narrative, why the standard Islamic narrative is sketchy, and we use the acronym SIN, S-I-N, for the standard Islamic narrative. Today's um, show will focus on the first of many topics under that umbrella. The topic for today's uh, show is what is sketchy about Muhammad's story, or technically speaking, the Sira of Muhammad. What we mean by the Sira, the biography of Muhammad. With us here remotely, uh, our brother Mel. Mel, thank you so much again for joining us. And uh, Great to be back. excited about uh, this uh, video series. So t oh, tell us now about the story of Muhammad and what is so sketchy about it. Okay, so obviously the biography of Muhammad is super important for Muslims. The whole of Islam hangs on the, this biography, but it doesn't take much inquiry to discover that there's a lot of flaws in the story. There's a lot of things which are sketchy. So in this program, I'm just going to point out a few examples just to give you an idea of the level of sketchiness that are in the story. And I'm picking elements of the story which would be very familiar to most of our audience. So to begin with, if we take the example of Muhammad was born in 570 in the year of the elephant, with emphasis on the elephant. So the backstory is that Abraham was supposed to have taken an elephant all the way up to Mecca from Yemen to attack the Kaaba. Correct. You ask most Muslims, that's taken to be true, and there's no question about it. And the fact that um, it, the year the elephant happened at the same year that Muhammad was born is used to prove that Muhammad was born in that year. So everything hinges around it. But let's have a look at it. There are numerous problems with it. The elephant was called Mahmoud, which is a variation of the name Muhammad. That, to me, sounds a bit sketchy. Um, it sounds to me like someone is making up a story here. It's a bit too much of a coincidence. Number two, an elephant wouldn't survive the waterless deserts of the Hejaz. Elephants need to um, be uh, regularly covered in water and mud to keep themselves cool. They have no sweat glands. If you were to send them through um, a desert for any length of time, they would literally just keel over and die. So that's a major problem. No one seems to raise that issue. Another issue is why bring a, an elephant all that way in order to destroy the Kaaba? Camels could have done the same job. So why, why bring an elephant? It seems pointless. And another issue, and this is a more important issue really, is that a rock inscription proves Abraham's expedition was in 552, not 570. Right. And, and this I wanna, is, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish, finish your thought. And, and this also is confirmed by the Roman historian Procopius. Right. And I want to point out to people that uh, there was an article that was written about this uh, uh, at the answering-islam.org. You can go and read about it. And also, if you go just to academia.edu, you can search under Abraha and you'll come across a number of scholarly articles dealing with this uh, uh, basically uh, contradiction or uh, discrepancy, if you wish. Yeah, um, and just in, in terms of the last point, um, you know, if if people want to claim that Muhammad was really born in the year of the elephant, well, then you're going to have to say he was born much earlier. That's right. In in, in 552. So by the time of uh, say 622, um, he would have been an old man, or get not quite an old man, but he's much older than people would have thought. Um, would he been able for all the battles that he supposedly did if he was born that much earlier? I doubt it. Um, so that's a major problem. Yeah, um, yes, absolutely. And there's another issue is that Abraham died long before 570, sometime in the 550s from what I remember. Um, so that's another issue. So there's no opening there for this to be true. Um, and so the fact that they've linked the year 570 with this story would suggest that they've got their facts wrong, you know? And if if they can get 
such a very important point wrong. We're talking about the birth of, of Muhammad. They can't get that right. What else can they not get right? It sounds really dodgy. Um, like you would have thought that the birth of Muhammad should have been really clear. They would have got the year correct. They would have got the historical details around the year of his birth correct. But um, it gets more embarrassing, though. But if then we we're talking at... Islam, brother. You know, you can't get everything <laughs> correct. And Allah knows best, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Allah or maybe the Buddha, because what's interesting when you look into it is the Buddha was born in the year of the elephant. That sounds a bit sketchy, doesn't it? That's right. Um, the Buddha was also born the year of the elephant. Um, the Buddha's mother, Maya, had a dream of an elephant when the Buddha was conceived. She died soon after his birth. Now, if we think about where all the Hadiths were being written, they were written in eastern Iran, as far east even into Afghanistan and so on, places like right. that. And these are places that used to be Buddhist centers. Um, and so we can quite easily see how the people who were formerly Buddhists who joined Islam started bringing their old ideas and start influencing the story and basically polluted whatever narrative that they were trying to create about Muhammad. And, and what's interesting in this story of the Buddha, um, his mother also supposedly died soon after his birth. Um, so there's too many similarities to just to, to say, well, this is just a coincidence. But for Muhammad's mother to also have died after his birth, same as the Buddha's mother, and that she also um, gave birth to the Buddha in the year of the elephant because of having a dream, it's just too, it's too sketchy. So that's one example of the sketchiness in the story. And my verdict is it uh, sounds sketchy. So, so that's that, that detail. Yeah. Now, another issue is the, the idea that Muhammad started his mission in 610, 610, and he died in 632. In trying to make the standard Islamic narrative fit somehow historically, I postulated that Ias ibn Kapisa al tay who ruled in Iraq, the land of the Tayyaye, as the first in the line of Arab rulers. Now, why did I postulate him? It's because the sin says that the first ruler in the line of rulers was Muhammad. So if, if Ias was the ruler, and I showed in earlier episodes that he would have been the, the first ruler because of Chinese sources, but the contradictions continued. Um, and the reason for that is there are essentially lies and fictions going on in the narrative itself. And I was banging my head against the wall trying to make it work, and it, nothing worked. Um, so just to reiterate, Es ruled on behalf of the Persians until the year that the Arabs started raiding in 617. And the sin called their first ruler Muhammad, but it didn't work. However, I've come to realize that this was a pur purposeful misdirection. The tweakers of the Sen naturally wanted to make Muhammad the founder of this empire. Mm -hmm. And I found out that the inherent contradictions in the Sen cannot be resolved due to their falsity. So when we go to the very earliest references to uh, Muhammad, we find that it immediately disproves the idea that he was the founder at the beginning. So you, you have a problem. You've got a later narrative contradicting the earliest references. And as tr try as much as I, 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 I did, I couldn't make it reconcile. So just to make that clear, if we take these two earliest references to a, a Muhammad, they place him alive in 634, exactly when the sin says Umar, who lived or who ruled from 634, and 644, 644 was the leader. You can see That's the right. problem. That's right. So, so the sin says that Muhammad died in 632. And yet the, what we find is the two earliest sources that we have that precede the standard Islamic narrative, they both place Muhammad alive in 634, the same year that Umar is in charge. I mean, how is that possible? Is it possible I Muhammad resurrected after the death? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, I spent uh, about two and a half years doing my very best trying to make this make sense. And I, and 
in the end, the only conclusion you can draw is that Umar must have originally been the Muhammad. That's the only conclusion that you can draw. Um, no, 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 so I'm fair, contradicting myself. I'm holding my hand up and saying, yes, yes, he was the founder of this. But if we if we take these two sources, we'd have to say Muhammad is the is the person mentioned in these sources because it's 634. That's right. Um, so it's a it's a major problem. And I know the Taoists may point the finger and laugh and say, oh, Mel's got it wrong, but it's not my fault I got, it, got this wrong. This is the, the problem inherent in the narrative. The narrative is so faulty, so sketchy, that when you start doing research, you just can't resolve the, the contradictions that are in the story itself. Um, so that's, um, that's a major um, uh, problem. And... Given all that, the sin appears to be airbrushing Muhammad out of the year 634. And the big question that leads to is why? Um, and I would suggest the reason why they had to remove him from 634 was because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time to make the later narrative about Mecca work. If they want Muhammad way down in the Hejaz, but Muhammad of history was way up in um, Israel, in Jerusalem and places like that, east of, um, um, I've forgotten the name of the place, um, Gaza. Mm -hmm. He's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and the, the early uh, fiction writers, pulp, pulp fiction writers, um, basically had a problem. How are they going to make Muhammad fit way down in Mecca if, if he's actually in a, in a different place in 634? And the only way they could do it was they had to shift his biography back in time so that he he could be placed in um in the Hijaz, supposedly. That's that's why I think all of this got messed up. And uh, they couldn't just settle with the truth, whatever that truth was originally. They kept tweaking it. And the more they tweaked it, the more um contradictions were produced. And and even with Ibn uh, uh, Isaac, his version of the Sira had got clearly had flaws in it because not only was it updated with Ibn Hisham, but they weren't willing even to leave the original copy there. They destroyed it. That's right. And, and also, uh, some of the remnants of his uh, uh, biography uses phrases like "I heard," you know. So, so he didn't even investigate things on his own. He was just relying on hearsay. Absolutely, yeah, and probably using that as an excuse as well for the fact that um, so much of his um, biography was very um, fantastical. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, now, another area of interest is if we, if we look at the Alawite belief, um, and that throws up some other issues in relation to Umar, they, they basically say that Ali is the mana, or God's manifestation, Muhammad is the hijab or veil that conceals Ali's true identity. And Salman al-Farsi is the, the al-bab or the gate. Now, this will be very new to probably most people in the audience who are not familiar with Alawite, um, Alawite beliefs. Um, this information was very hard to come by because it's very secretive. But if you notice, there's a kind of like a triune idea with Ali, Muhammad and Salman forming uh, almost like a trinity, as, as it were. Mm -hmm. Now, if we compare that with what Leo III wrote, um, we find a spooky parallel. So um, I'll bring that up there. Um, I'm going to have to lean forward because I can hardly read it. But it says, it was Umar, Ali, Turab, and Salman, uh, Salman the Persian, who composed the, um, the Purkan, which is the Quran. Okay? So right. why is that... Uh, of interest. Well, if we see the commonalities there, we discover that Umar corresponds to Muhammad, whereas Abu Turab corresponds, corresponds to Ali, and obviously Salman the Persian would be Salman al Farsi. That's correct. So if we take Leo III's word on that, it seems to be that as early as, or as late, let's say, as uh, 717, 741, when Leo III ruled. He was a Byzantine emperor. He was aware of Umar being one of the composers of the Quran in, in, 
in conjunction with Abu Turab or Ali and Salman, whoever Salman was. Mm -hmm. This would suggest that Muhammad and Umar were considered, at least at that time, one and the same person. Um, that's that kind of reinforces the the earlier slides that we looked at, which said that Muhammad uh, was alive in 634, the same time as Umar. So this is a whole different kettle of fish here. But I think the, the most important point is, again, it shows up how sketchy the standard Islamic narrative is. Yeah. And let me um, just uh, uh, highlight a few things. I mean, uh, let, yeah. let's anticipate some arguments back. There is confusion. You pointed that out clearly. So it's on them to try to clarify the confusion. Even if Omar is not Muhammad and Muhammad is not Omar, we still have a problem that Muhammad was still alive in 634 versus died in 632, you know? So thirdly, you've heard right now that the Emperor Leo considered Omar to be the composer of the Quran. In fact, one of the narratives about the collection of the Quran points to Omar to be the primary person who composed the whole thing. So there is yeah. truth to that as well, if we rely on an Islamic narrative. Yeah. And there's an awful lot of evidence coming through from various scholars that would suggest that uh, the Quran is the result of a patchwork of compositions from more than one author. So there's lots of additional um, external evidence that, that would back up Leo III's claim as well. Um, so the interesting thing about the, the word he uses for the Quran, which is Furkan, it means salvation. And Umar's epithet is al Farouk. That's right. Which, reinfor which reinforces the idea. So you have salvation and the savior. Um, so my verdict really on this one is that the sin is sketchy. It looks like it was reworked, leaving anomalies in the timeline. So there ends my, yeah. my bit on that. And also, I mean, uh, al Furqan sometimes it means the divider between the right and wrong, dark and light, you know, uh, either way. Uh, I mean, that's one of the names. But yes, uh, 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 Omar is known to be Omar al Farooq, you know, so, so there is, is it a coincidence? I mean, so we want people to begin to look at these things. Uh, what my brother here is doing is pointing out the obvious. There are contradictions, there are discrepancies that demand an answer. And we're not the one who sh should answer it. We're pointing out to you, Dawa people, please step into the plate and begin to answer it for us. Don't do videos just to get viewership, right? We want you to answer these things. We're not asking you to bring viewerships to your video. But thank you, by the way, when you do these uh, videos to attack us, you bring more viewers to us. So please keep doing that. Of course, we appreciate that. But all that to say is answer the arguments, present factual answers, don't use emotions, you know, emotions don't work, you know? I mean, we got Kleenex, by the way, if you want to wipe your tears, but that doesn't work also. You need to give us facts, and that's what we are doing here. So, brother, what is the next uh, show well, going to be about? I, I, I made a mistake, actually. There's a tiny bit more I need to share. There's one other little example I want to share. Oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. Keep going, and then tell us about the next show. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, one other um, element that's sketchy is according to the Sen, Muhammad dies of poisoned food. We were all familiar with that story. Mm -hmm. um, when we look into it, it's interesting, once again, a parallel with the Buddha. They both die of poisoned meat. In the case of the Buddha, he reportedly died after eating spoiled meat. Some say he died from food poisoning from contaminated pork. Obviously, contaminated pork wouldn't work with Muhammad. So in his case, it was contaminated lamb. And look at these two images as well, just to reinforce the point. On the left is uh, the Buddha, the enlightened one. The Buddha means the enlightened one. And here on the right is actually uh, a 16th century image of Muhammad, again, depicting him as the enlightened one. So there's a strong Buddhist connection going on there through the centuries, probably because the Taoists from centuries ago were trying to convert the Buddhists to Islam. And the best way to do it is to present Muhammad as a Buddha. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, quite And we, we just want to emphasize yes. here, Mel is not saying Muhammad is Buddha, but what a coincidence no. <laughs> you have similar stories. What a coincidence. Yeah. And by the way, you pointed something. Muhammad is drawn in a piece of art. Wow. That's a first. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and here, here's another one, actually. The origin of the Shia Ashura practice of self-flagellation right. is suspiciously like a Buddhist memorialization of the Buddha's death. And I found this actually in um, a piece of artwork. It's from the eighth century. It's in, uh, it's basically a Buddha 
uh, Buddhist painting, right smack in the middle of China. And in, in the, the red box there, you can see there's a Buddhist stabbing himself with knives in uh, memory of uh, the Buddha's death. And it doesn't take a genius to see how those two um, practices are very similar. If we take that in context with all of the other parallels with Buddhism, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Islam borrowed that practice from Buddhism, brought it into the religion, and, and then it became um, used as a way of uh, remembering Hussein's death. Um, that's obviously it's speculative, but I think it, it's certainly suspiciously like that in my view. Right, right. Interesting. So this is the conclusion then of that particular show. And I think next one is going to be about did Muhammad really ban images in his time? So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, most people believe that um, in Muhammad's time, he, he was against drawing um, images of people or animals. And, and so therefore, all the way through history, Muslims didn't paint any images of Muhammad right to this day. Right. But actually, the truth is uh, the reverse of that, as Very we'll good. see. And uh, it's going to be eye-opening. Uh, eye Thank you. And uh, we are looking forward with anticipation now to uh, this next episode that deals with that issue about the ban of images at the time of Muhammad. Of course, many Muslims will tell you that uh, pictures are prohibited and even there are a number of alleged hadith that Muhammad stated about those images in a house and so on and so forth, that it drives angels out and uh, many other claims as well. So we will look at this uh, claim now next time when we meet. Hopefully you're enjoying this series now and you can see why we're telling you this is an exciting one and a very bold one as well. So um, please uh, make sure uh, not only you like him, but also spread the word about him and share him with others. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.